And so for us and for GuideWell, the, the motto became, there is no health without mental health. And once that motto and once your CEO says that and once everybody else says that, that permeates all the functions of the organization. So as a health solutions company, it permeates how we look at data. It permeates how we look at solutions. It permeates how we look at contracts with providers. Welcome to a and Healthcare Industry Group's What's Your Moonshot podcast series where world-class healthcare leaders seek to solve big problems. Listen as we talk to today's health system CEOs about the journey to achieve their moonshots. Welcome to AM's What's Your Moonshot podcast series. I'm Craig Savage, a managing director in Alvarez and Marcel's Health Industry Group, and I lead our health plans and managed care practice. I'm delighted to be joined by my co-host, Dr. David Shulkin, Ninth Secretary of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs and an a and Senior Advisor. Today, we welcome Dr. Nick Dewan, Vice President of Behavioral Health at GuideWell. In this role, he is responsible for creating a cross-functional team that designs and implements the enterprise's behavioral health strategy for all insurance segments. This includes creating new value-based reimbursement models and new roles in the care delivery system, as well as a broad view of behavioral health across demographics and specific points of care. Dr. Dewan's accomplished background is as a nationally known physician leader and sports psychiatrist working with amateur, collegiate, and professional athletes. He has developed sports meditation soundtracks internet-based sports mental skills improvement tools, and designed and conducted a neurofunctional MRI study on golfers and anxiety. He joined GuideWell in 2020 and has worked on transforming technology innovations, clinician-led initiatives, health services research publications, and policy leadership. He has more than 22 peer-reviewed publications and is the quality and lead editor for three books in information technology. We are excited to have you on this podcast today, and welcome. It's good to be here with you all. Great to see you, Nick. Same here. Dr. Dewan, your moonshot focuses on mental health, something that has become a critical element of healthcare today, especially after the onset of the pandemic, and it continues today. It is increasingly important and touches more and more people's lives every single day. Tell us about your moonshot goal and the efforts you're putting forth to achieve it. Yeah, well, Craig, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up about the pandemic. And here, here's a situation where we haven't, the world hasn't felt that for a century, where the entire world felt an invisible, unpredictable, potentially deadly threat. And everybody felt it. Everybody yeah. could relate to it. And so for us and for GuideWell, the, the motto became, there is no health without mental health. And once that motto and once your CEO says that and once everybody else says that, that permeates all the functions of the organization. So as a health solutions company, it permeates how we look at data. It permeates how we look at solutions. It permeates how we look at contracts with providers. And today, there is no data. Our moonshot was the principles integration. That means everything we do. And so today, there is no data that does not include behavioral health. There is no solution that does not include behavioral health. And there is no value-based contract in all of medical care for GuideWell that does not include behavioral health. That's a pretty big thing in healthcare is to do all of those things. Well, Nick, you know, knowing your CEO, Pat Garrity, knowing you, that doesn't really surprise me because this all comes from leadership. But so many managed care companies coming out of the pandemic have looked at behavioral health and looked at the rising costs and the rising utilization of behavioral health. And have sort of seen that as somewhat alarming and have put policies in place to try to limit access in many ways, not, not in a deliberate way, but try to make sure the costs are being controlled. Are you saying 
that that's not the approach at Florida Blue, that that you believe that by providing behavioral health care, that's the greatest way to add value to your beneficiaries and to your clients? Exactly. We, in fact, increased access. We promoted access. We remove barriers in, say, medical environments to all contracts regarding integrated behavioral health. And we grew the number of people seeking behavioral health. We sent emails. We sent millions of emails to our members saying, here's the number to call. Here's a digital solution you can use. Here's what you can do for your own well-being. And we permeated this concept of there's no health without mental health in all our sales, in all our retail centers, in all our marketing materials, in our websites. And so we really said, people are hurting, people are suffering. Let's, let's grow our provider network. Let's open the doors to care. And we saw a great jump in people accessing care. And we think that's a positive thing. And we think getting people to have the courage to say, I need help is the right thing to do. And we did that not only as a solutions company, we did that through our foundation as well, where we spent over $16 million in multiple communities to raise raise the awareness. Because you know, when you looked at the data across the country, 40, 50, 60% of the people suffering and stressed and the doors have to be opened and we had to create we had to create new ways of delivering BH. So I'm thrilled that we increased our expenditures, we increased and and the executives they all said it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. I just want to stick on this sort of business point of view because I think that there's been so much data suggesting that so much of the costs in healthcare are driven by behavioral issues. And that when you begin to address these behavioral issues in conditions like chronic illness, the costs actually come down. So have you begun to start generating any data to see what this type of philosophy, this type of clinical strategy is doing to the cost of care in the Florida network? Uh, actually, we've started that process in multiple areas. So we have, in the range of solutions we've deployed, whether it's a care management solution, when we when we assign behavioral health care managers to cohorts of members, we notice an incremental difference, a material difference in the savings. When we give patients access to self-management solutions, we see monetary changes. We may see increased outpatient care, which is fine, but we see reductions in ER use and medical hospitalizations. We do the same thing with people with cancer, people with heart disease, mothers with postpartum depression. And sometimes we may not save tons of dollars, but we've helped people live better lives for the same money, let's say we would have spent, say, on two ER visits, we spent on 20 outpatient visits. Was that life better? Although the money was the same, absolutely that life was better. And so we we look at it both ways. Yes, of course, savings are important. It's we have to make healthcare more affordable, we have to make it more efficient. But can we? You know, Pat Garrity, and I'm glad you brought up his name. You know, can we be a force for good in society? Can yeah. we can we move the needle in terms of people's lives? Can we help them flourish? And when we do that, everybody benefits. Us, the employer, the customer, the citizen, society uh, is improved because of that. So picking up on that that point, Dr. Dewan, I mean, you're really talking about something that not a lot of organizations are thinking about or even addressing, the ability to really support their employees, to create a company culture that reduces the stigma around mental health and actually increases the acceptance of mental health as there's no health without mental health. 
How are you thinking about uh, mental health in terms of its contribution to the quality of care and outcomes? How is that really impacting the way you think about outcomes and quality of care? Can you talk more about that? Okay, sure. All right. So let me address both those things, the employee aspect and the outcomes and quality aspect. So from an employee aspect, we have something called a, a community group within our company called the Mental Health Collaborative. They drive... They help support our strategy. They help us have conversations internally. Now, and we have forums. We just had a forum a few days ago about how to deal with stress and crisis. And the CEO is involved. The chief HR person is involved. So as an employee, it's the stigma is busted. Now, in terms of quality and outcomes, now this is a, a passion of mine because I've been doing measurement of outcomes for over three decades. All right. And so yeah. we have a system now where our partner, Lucid, where for certain members that use that service, we can track what is your suffering when you enter treatment? What is your anxiety? What is your depression? What is your functioning? What is your well-being? Three months later, six months later, nine months later, are you better off? Now, we do that not only in our network. We do that in our care management processes. We do that in our digital solutions. And here's the great part, Craig. We have provider partners that have committed to do this with us. Awesome. We have provider yeah. partners that said, you know what? We're, you know, I'm going back to that. There is no health without mental health. If you went to a primary care doctor and got treated for hypertension, and if you didn't get your blood pressure taken for eight months and treatment got changed, how would you know you're better? Right. You cannot have you cannot have care today in behavioral health unless you know where you're headed. And so that sort of that's outcomes monitoring and that feeds into quality. Now, quality is also about, you know, and Dr. Shalkin is like the expert, I think, in the world in this area. So I'm kind of I'm hesitant to even say anything about quality, but with, with him in the room, but it's, it's not only outcomes, it's who delivers and how it's done. And so we look at all three aspects, but I'm a real fan of knowing, are we getting the right results? Because behavioral health has been focused on, are we doing the right thing? And maybe not measuring, are we getting the right results? And so we're, we're emphasizing, are we measuring, getting the right results? Fantastic. Well, um, I think, Nick, to be able to implement your vision, and you're clearly doing it, this takes a lot of work to be able to integrate behavioral health care and physical health care. Mm -hmm. And it really is a culture change in many organizations, but there are workforce issues. Do you have enough behavioral health care staff to do it? There are data issues because, as you know, physical and behavioral health have been data siloed for long periods of time. And then they're just really overcoming the the issue of um, the issue of thinking about care this way and the provider education. So, how have you gone about changing all the systems that you have to do and impacting the culture of the organization? Okay, well, those are okay. Those three things. Um, let 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 me start with the provider. Um, what I would call hurdle, you know, breaking through that hurdle. The good news is in our, we met with over 6,000 practices in the past few years. And we asked them 6,000 practices. And we said, are you ready to do something about behavioral health? Because we're ready to do something about it. And the majority of people said, absolutely I want, it, I want you to make it easier for me to refer my patient. I want to make it easier for me to hire somebody. And so having those conversations, because, you know, let's go back to what you started with was here we are in the greatest stress that the world has ever seen where everybody got it. Everybody got what mental health. And then they came to us and say, we're ready to tackle with it because our patients are saying it. So they were ready. And then what we had to do was remove the data barriers and I think the new laws that got passed by the federal government say there can be sharing. 
you know, with appropriate consent. So I think some of the barriers in terms of data sharing were removed. And that allows you to have some data interoperability, not, not ideal, but some. So you had a readiness of the medical community and the behavioral health community. You had some policy restrictions and barriers removed so you could do better technology into what we call interoperability, but now the workforce issue. So here's how we're dealing with that. And I think in the industry, there are six different ways people are dealing with. Number one, when you do integrated primary care and use collaborative care, you basically allow a primary care practice to be able to treat 200 people and you get occasional advice from the expert. So that say psychiatrist, instead of spending, you know, having a two month delay, it's, it's gone because you're supporting that primary care practice. That's number one. I think the new policy to expand who can belong in certain health plan environments, whether it's social workers, whether it's psychologists, counselors, even peers, okay, coaches, I think that's an expansion. But for us, one of the greatest thing I think we did, and we did this as an employer, is we worked with our friends at Harvard and to talk about this concept of community-initiated care where everybody wants to do good for their friends, their family, their neighbors, their loved ones. But do they really know how to have those, what I would call initial conversations? And how, how do you create that social cohesion? So I think for us, it's building the entire layers of community workforce, not only from what I would say the most experienced and the most long-term trained, and scaling that using technology, but also taking advantage of coaching, peers, and community at large. And so that's what we're doing. We do that with our grants around the state. We do that internally as employers. So I do think that we are addressing the workforce issues temporarily. I hope in the next 10 years, we'll have a much bigger workforce. But in the meantime, we're using everything we can to close the gap. Fantastic. So, Nick, you know, there are probably a lot of people that are going to listen to this podcast that are going to mm -hmm. say, I wish that I was in the type of situation that Guidewell is. And, you know, a lot of people probably very much believe in what you're saying. What advice would you give your peers, those that are, those that are heading up behavioral health care programs in the managed care environment? All right. So number one, ha have your philosophy right. Embrace with, with a level of conviction that there is no health without mental health. That's the more, that, that is, once you have that conviction in your heart, that's number one. Number two though, what is your North Star? And for us, and there's a famous saying with, I, I think Yogi Berra said this, if you don't know where you're going, you're going to probably end up someplace else. Okay. That's that famous saying with Yogi. So what yeah. we did, we said, well, if there is no health without mental health, then mental well-being is our North star, you know, a hopeful, positive, emotional state that where there's a sense of meaning and purpose in life and satisfaction with relationships and the ability to deal with stressors and you commit to measuring it. So we've done that. We've defined well-being, and nobody in the past half century has defined it. So we've defined it. We want everybody to embrace our definition, and we're measuring it now. Okay? So have your North Star, define your North Star, measure your North Star, and then leverage technology in every conceivable way to scale human potential. And I know we don't, you know, I could spend hours talking about technology. I could spend a lot of time talking about AI. And I think that is a major part of our future. But if we don't include and immerse ourselves in how data works and how technology works, we will not scale human potential. And that's what, it's not only the human potential of the workforce, it's the human potential of the people you're serving. 
And so that I, I think you approach it that way. And then from then, from there, ideas flow. But what are the four things we can do? For us, it was we have this broad spectrum of behavioral health. We have people with severe mental illness. We have people with anxiety and depression. We have people that are just stressed and hurting. We have young, we have middle age, we have old age, we have uh, uh, moms. How do we serve a population and how do we serve every conceivable need in that population? So I guess yeah. I said four things. I said those four things. And so that's how I, I think anybody getting into this business, you know, everybody knows access, quality, affordability, convenience, you know, take care of your workforce. I mean, th those are like accepted. But I think down and gritty, you're going to have to solve the problem. You got to have those major functions. So that's how that's my advice to people. And um, I, I'm just as you can tell, I'm very passionate about this. I enjoy what I do. I enjoy being with Guidewell. I enjoy being a culture that you know, when your values are courage and imagination, you get to dream. You get to dream, David. And not only do you get to dream, you get to solve. And, and, and that difference between dreaming and solving, you know, that that's that's a great that's a that's a great sort of adventure to be on. So well, first of all, thank you, Dr. Dewan. This has been amazing. I mean, no health without mental health. That is something that I think could become a national wellness campaign. I absolutely love it. And the discussion around establishing a North Star, leveraging data, leveraging technology, and it cascading down from the top. I, I think there, you know, enough can't be said about a CEO's agenda being tied to this, whether it's a healthcare company or whether it's a technology company. The overall health of your employees. I do believe starts with mental health. And I, I've really enjoyed the conversation today. Thank you. No, oh, thank you for having me. And thank you for uh, allowing me to, to share all these thoughts with you today. I think that this is really an amazing moonshot and something that we hope that you're going to inspire others around the country. And this is really something that I think the insurance company started a long time ago, decades ago, <laughs> by separating out with carve outs. And now there's the time to integrate it back in together. And that's exactly what you're doing. So we're going to be watching and rooting for you along yeah. the way. But uh, we expect great things, Nick. Let me end with this. Although in the past there were these carve outs, okay, but I think now, even with separate companies, it's really an integrated partnership. And no right. matter where you go, you can have a separate BH sort of specialty kind of organization, but it's got to be tightly integrated. I think we've done that. And so I think it's important for the audience to know that those integrations are critical, not only with the medical side, but with the behavioral health specialty company side. So really, that integration is just critical. I'm glad you clarified that because I think that's an important point. And you know, it really it really is the vision at the top, and then you can put the pieces together in a number of different ways. So thanks again for spending the time with us on What's Your Moonshot, and uh, I always appreciate having a chance to catch up with you. Alvarez and Marcel. Leadership. Action. Results.